<laughs> but I, I know that this is a story that touches many people quite deeply. And I hope that I've told it uh, honestly and fairly. And I think that the hysteria or the hysterical tone of some of the criticism reveals that I did. I did do a good job. And, and I'll, I'll speak about that. But I'd also like to address the charges that I'm an anti-Mormon, and I think they're preposterous because I am still a Mormon. And I'm uh, a heritage Mormon. I have a great-great-grandfather, grandfathers and grandmothers on all sides who crossed the plains, most of them before the railroad. Uh, I'm very proud of that heritage, and I'm very proud of the Mormon people. Um, that said, I never believed the theology since I was uh, old enough to think about it. <laughs> but at the same time, I don't have, uh, I don't hold any grudges. I have many dear Mormon friends. And I do not believe that this book will take anyone's testimony away from it. Uh, although I do believe that the book the church is putting out might well shake, might well lose the church any number of people. But most of you know the general, how many of you know the story of the Mountain Meadows Massacre? Well, those of you who don't, I will give it a very brief summary. In the fall of 18, actually late summer of 1857, a party of 140 immigrants from Arkansas were attacked by Mormons and Indians in southern Utah at an oasis on the California Trail. They were besieged for five days. At the end of five days, uh, the Mormon military, uh, it was run, the operation was run by the militia officers, went in, uh, negotiated a surrender, persuaded the people to give up their arms, divided into three groups, uh, and promised them protection from the Indians and an escort back to Cedar City. And about a mile and a half from their camp, uh, the order was given, do your duty, or more likely, do your duty to God. And the Mormon uh, soldiers turned on the men next to them and shot them down. And then the Mormons, disguised as Indians, hiding in the brush, came out and slaughtered the women and children. Now, I have been challenged by people who say that I provide base. I, my interpretation is that this was an ideological act, that this was done not as an act of anger or as an act of quote unquote frontier violence, but as a religious act, as a, an act of religious anger, as an act that was only motivated by deeply held religious beliefs. And I believe that that is probably why my book, and I think my book should be disturbing to anybody, uh, no matter what their religious affiliations or non-religious affiliations, because it asks a very hard question. How can decent men murder in the name of God? And it's a question that um, I thought, as I worked on the book, I thought it was extremely relevant. But as I dealt with these issues of theocracy and fanaticism, I knew they were important human subjects, but I thought, you know, a few Americans are really going to relate to this. And last fall I was working at the Beinecke Library and uh, it became very, very relevant to Americans. And I think that there are a number of unfortunate parallels between what happened a year ago on September 11th and what happened 145 years ago at Mountain Meadows. Why did these people do it? I want to read you something that isn't, there, there's pieces of it, but not much of it is in the book. And uh, the, this is taken from the Cedar State Journal, which is available in the William Palmer Collection at Southern Utah University Archives. It's a record of the church meetings that were held in Southern Utah uh, from about December 1856 until 1858 when the stake was dissolved. Uh, 
uh, many of the men, that I'm, almost all the men I'm quoting here, will be involved in the massacre in one way or the other. Although Rufus Allen was replaced as head of the Southern Indian Mission by Jacob Hamlin, uh, quite obviously, because uh, Allen probably wouldn't have taken part in the event, and Hamlin would do what he was told. Uh, and Hamlin, of course, wasn't there, but it's very significant that they replaced Rufus Allen. But on the 19th of December, 1856, President John M. Higby spoke of the benefits of the society and of us not encouraging those blood-sucking Gentiles that bring us their goods. December 21st, 1856. Elder Rufus Allen made remarks on the necessity of the saints being faithful in all circumstances and of doing the will of the Lord in all things. President John M. Higby made remarks of the necessity of us as saints living in subjugation unto those who are placed over us in the Lord, and of the Lord not giving us any commandments that we cannot keep. President Elias Morris spoke of the saints not judging those who are above us and of minding our own business and doing what we are told. January 29, 1857. Elder Richard Harrison, having returned from the legislature, arose to address a large assembly of the saints. The time has come that we cannot fool with the Almighty. If we do right, we can get forgiveness. The most damnable sins of this people are disregard unto the authorities. We have tried to get around it, but we cannot. President Isaac Haight, having also returned from the sitting of the legislature, arose to address the saints. The chief sins of this people are disrespect to the holy priesthood, and the pruning time has come. February 1st, 1857, Richard Harrison arose and said, we have to bring ourselves into subjugation to the proper authorities and got to reform in everything and make things right. Then we shall have the spirit of the Lord. Unless we are obedient to the priesthood, we cannot be saved. This goes on and on and on. And, and obviously not everybody was happy with this because uh, there's a new subject introduced about May. President Elias Morris, the people of this place of late are indulging in liquor. The women even take the whiskey jug into their tea party and must treat a friend. I say let the men, women, and children who indulge in it leave it off unless you will go down and be condemned. Saturday, July 12, 1857, President I.C. Haight spoke and said, Myself and Brother Western will not sell any more liquor unless the people bring a recommend from the bishop. <laughs> These people were different than modern Latter-day Saints. <laughs> September 13th, 1857. At 10 o'clock a.m., meeting opened by singing. Patriarch Elisha H. Groves spoke upon the principles of the gospel and of the Lamanites being the battle axe of the Lord and of our faithfulness to the gospel. 2 p.m. meeting, opened by singing prayer by I.C. Haight. Haight spoke upon the spirit of the times and of Cousin Lemuel being fired up with the spirit of their fathers. Singing benediction by Bishop P.K. Smith. That last entry occurred two days after Isaac Haight had viewed the, the rema naked remains of 120 men, women, and children, including 80 women and children, the majority of them being children. Now, I'm astonished that I still have people who I would consider friends who argue that this was done because these people basically behaved badly and made people in southern Utah mad at them, so they just went out and killed them all. Never in the entire fury and blood of the Civil War did one, members of one side or another kill children of seven years old. It never happened. 
These were not crimes of anger. These were crimes of ideology. Now, it's interesting that I probably would never have decided to tackle this story if uh, I was left to my own devices, because I knew the problems with the evidence. And I knew it was a significant event, because as I dealt with many other areas of Mormonism, I found that it was like Charybdis, I think, or Skyla, the great uh, whirlpool in the Odyssey that draws everything in, into it. And it is such a compelling event that once it happens, it's like a black hole, and it distorts the rest of Mormon history for the 19th century. It becomes a millstone around the neck of the church. And although Brigham Young's biographers pretend that it was something that he only learned about 20 years later, and you know, it really wasn't that big a deal, um, it haunted him, and it never let up on him. And I believe he went to his grave knowing exactly what he had done and knowing that he would have to answer to the consequences. Although at many times he, uh, he doesn't appear to be of that mindset. And as is typical of Brigham Young, he does everything humanly possible to shift the blame to someone else, including betraying the man who executed the crime following Brigham Young's orders. It is an amazing story. Uh, and what surprises me is that it's not over. That the same patterns that I perceived taking place in Utah Territory in 1859 and 1860 are still happening. The Deseret News has never printed an honest word about the Mountain Meadows Massacre, and they still refuse to do it. When they launched an ad hominem attack on this book and me, they chose to lie. There are many ways that you could criticize this book, but they, they went back to being true to form. Rather than make legitimate criticisms, they said, uh, the headline was, Anti-Mormon Tract Compares Young to Hitler. <laughs> Tracts are seldom 500 pages long. And the last time I checked, the University of Oklahoma wasn't into publishing tracts. Um, also, quite interestingly, the word Hitler does not appear in the book. Um, they quoted an alleged quote in which I was supposed to be quote unquote attacking Leonard Arrington. It's a misquote. It is taken, you know, I, I, you know, I, I often question people saying, well, it's taken out of context. This was literally taken out of context of a comparison between a very anti Brigham Young biography and Leonard Arrington's cream puff biography, official biography of Brigham Young. And it says at the end, neither of them do justice to Brigham Young. Um, and I believe most historians would agree with that assessment. But they had to twist it around to make it a sound as if I was simply criticizing Leonard Arrington, uh, who ironically did so much for the Mormons in their history and has been absolutely viciously attacked and his memory has been trashed by, ironically, the lead author of their forthcoming Apologia on the Mountain Meadows Massacre. Um, and I, 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 obviously, it, it aggravates me a little bit, but I do want to say I'm much more entertained. And if I'd have been, I really should have sent the author of the review a bouquet of roses, because I'm sure he sold at least 500 books. And they, they published a big picture, you know, and it, it, I think they published it because it shows me with a beard, and that, of course, would demonize me to most of their audience. Uh, but it wasn't a bad picture, so I can't, I just really can't complain about all the publicity anyway. But it is fascinating to see these patterns repeat themselves again and again. And Kelly asked me to basically, she was quite pleased with a talk I gave several months ago. And I'll uh, provide you with some of the basic outline of what that talk was about. And it begins by looking at the Mormon 
kingdom of God, which was formally announced in the spring of 1845 by, ironically, Apostle Parley P. Pratt. Pratt wrote in a remarkable pamphlet, The kingdom of God has come, even that kingdom which will fill the whole earth and shall stand forever. The revolutionary purpose of the kingdom of God and, their millennial, and its millennial plan was to reduce all nations and creeds to one political and religious standard and thus put an end to the babble of forms and names and to strife and war. The earth's rulers must take a lively interest with the saints of the Most High and the covenant people of the Lord or you will become their inveterate enemy. This was the charter that justified for Brigham Young the application of any level of violence necessary in his eyes to further the interests of the kingdom of God. It is what laid the foundation for Mormon violence in the American West. And I'm sure that you, if you pay close attention to this subject, you're likely to hear many um, interpretations and say, well, you know, this was, the frontier was a very violent place. And this was just another example of uh, frontier violence. Uh, well, again, uh, it does have some very singular characteristics. And Mormon violence is itself singular. Brigham Young, and often it's in the context of writing letters to the government denying any responsibility for the Mount Meadows Massacre, but he says again and again, we have the most orderly society in the West. We don't have any vigilante movements. Stalin had a pretty orderly society too, and he had to fill his, political, his prison camps with political prisoners. Um, But in fact, there was a different kind of violence. And it is one of the reasons you had a lower level of the typical uh, drunken rampages, uh, looting operations, the, the violence that was endemic and extensive on the frontier. In Utah, you had official violence. You had violence that was sanctioned from the pulpit. And in Utah, you had as, as, the, as their agenda laid out, one standard. You had a government until 1858 that was essentially also the religion. You had elections in which thousands of votes were cast and not a single dissenting vote was entered. You didn't have secret ballots, but you had absolutely unanimous elections. Um, and you can interpret that to mean either see that they were remarkably united and harmonious, or they had a, a, a state of terror over these people. Um, but what is to me most telling is that religious authorities would get up and talk about murder, talk about cutting throats, talk about taking revenge in the context of providing religious counsel. And of course, Mormon apolog apologists say that, uh, well, you know, Brigham Young said a lot of things, uh, but often he was joking, or he really didn't mean it. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, if you go, and I'm sure many of you looked at the Journal of Discourses, which is absolutely flabbergasting. And re but remember, the Journal of Discourses was sanitized. It had been cleaned up three times before it was published in Liverpool. First of all, it was cleaned up as the clerks were taking down the messages, or the, the addresses. And it's fascinating because the clerks were all English trained clerks, often trained in uh, uh, business or legal shops. And they go along, and sometimes you can actually see what Brigham Young's saying. And then they'll go back and correct the grammar and eliminate the vulgarities. And Brigham Young spoke much more colorfully than even what appears in the uh, 
Journal of Discourses. And he loved four-letter words, and in many ways, the cruder the better. Turd, another favorite word. Um, uh, it's amazing, not only in Brigham Young's case, but to see the term shit-ass uh, come out of the minutes of a state conference. Um, and essentially, it was because Mormons looked at uh, blasphemy as evil, and it was one of the things that you apparently could get blood and tone for. Uh, they didn't enforce it that much, because Brigham Young would get up and blaspheme in, in, in public. But they figured that as long as you didn't take the name of uh, Jesus or God in vain, anything else was fair game. And it, it was a way that Brigham Young really connected with the people, because he was a folk preacher. He was a very powerful folk preacher. And this was, a, this was a time when they didn't write up all these speeches, send them to the correlation committee, get them back, read them from the teleprompters, and if necessary, retake them. <laughs> they got up and spoke from the spirit. And to, to follow through on the process, after the clerks had taken it down and then gone through and revised it, it was then published in the Deseret News. And at that point, they would often drop out some of the more provocative language. Uh, it was then shipped over to England, where almost certainly it was generally handled by English converts, because the Mormon apostles themselves were not very literate. And it's amazing, if you study Mormon newspapers, that they are so well done. And if you look at the journals of editors like uh, Wilford Woodruff, it's clear that they had only the most passing knowledge of grammar, spelling, and punctuation. Uh, but the, the publications themselves are really quite well done. And so in the English versions, they go through again and clean up the grammar and, uh, and sometimes eliminate more colorful phrases from the Deseret News. And you have what we now have is the Journal of Discourses, which is the sanitized published versions of the published talks. And much to my surprise, and I must say that LDS Archives was amazingly open with me, and they did provide me with any number of wonderful sources. Uh, and the, the professional staff was excellent. And the professional staff is now all engaged on researching the Mountain Meadows Massacre at enormous expense. Um, I, I, I keep getting distracted, but I was actually hired to do this. Excuse me. I spent two years on the bankroll of a California entrepreneur named Frank James Singer. Went all over the country, um, went to the National Archives, Huntington Library, Bancroft Library, uh, BYU Library. I was amazed what I found at BYU Library. Uh, spent two years doing basic research. I transcribed 800 pages of original source material. I transcribed uh, all, a good proportion of the Mountain Meadows file at LDS Archives, which is the remnants of the old subject file. And I was able to get, get at it and get through it before they went through and, and did another selective purge. And I had, I had John Delita come to me and say, you know, you gave me your notes, and I went up and tried to look at it, and they wouldn't let me see this stuff. Um, so I, I got there, I think, at the right time, anyway. And, yeah, you know, to their credit, it was a very wise policy, because let's face it, uh, Mormon archives do contain a lot of quote-unquote embarrassing information, but they were long ago purged. Uh, I've been informed, I've never seen his journal, but Andrew Jensen, longtime assistant church historian, describes consigning documents to the flames because they were so embarrassing. And so, except for items that only a real specialist would recognize, many of the most incriminating documents have long since been destroyed. And this was even admitted by one of the uh, authors of the forthcoming Mormon version of the book. But uh, after, but I, I do want to make clear that as part of the, the deal, I told Frank Singer that I would do, I would deliver him my best work and my professional conclusions as a historian, and that he would not get history made to order, and he might not be happy with what I concluded, 
but he would get what I consider an absolutely solid professional opinion. And that I would try to publish a book. Frank was going to write a novel and had already written uh, the screenplay to, uh, or the, he'd already written the acceptance speech for the Oscar that he was going to get for, the, for uh, his movie on Mountain Meadows. Um, after working for Frank for two years, it was a dream job. He paid me as much as I was making in the computer business. I went every place. All together, his company later informed me, he spent about $250,000 underwriting this investigation. Um, I wasn't paying, you know, I got a small fraction of that to pay, <laughs> but the expenses and all the rest of it, the overhead and time were pretty expensive. <laughs> so, yes? What was, what's Mr. Uh, Senator's background or his motivation, a descendant of the family. No, he was a he was from New Jersey. He was a Mormon convert. His first assignment in church was to teach church history, which <laughs> seems sort of odd. But he he took it up and he went and read the history of the church and he became fascinated by it. And from that he became interested in uh, Western history, the broader history of the West, and began assembling a pretty credible book collection. And he did divorce his wife, and I think, I, I never asked Frank, what are you doing this for? They told me it was for a, a novel, but I never said, wait a minute, why are you spending all this money? What are your personal motivations? But he, 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 he'd founded an insurance brokerage about 1992, hired me about 1995. And he, at the time he hired me in 95, his business was said to be worth $100 million. So he just rocketed to the top in the 90s economy. Um, and not long after he hired me, he went through a very bitter divorce. And his business empire was largely destroyed, but he still had substantial assets. And he also clearly was getting in trouble. He was an insurance broker and apparently had California insurance investigators after him. And the rumor was that the FBI was looking at him. And uh, I, it's towards the end of the, the assignment, I wanted to meet with him and, and say, look, can we extend it in another six months? I knew he was paying, he was paying $50,000 a month to his attorneys. So I said, well, he can, he can continue paying me for a little while anyway. And I kept, we kept setting dates to get together. And he kept canceling them, which I could sort of understand. And there was an article in the specific section of the Wall Street Journal on Frank and his rise and fall. Uh, and you might still be able to find it on the internet. But finally, in June of 1997, I got a call from his executive assistant, and she said, Frank's disappeared. And so that was pretty much the end of my dream job. <laughs> and I, I did have to uh, finance, and com finance the completion of the book on my own. The book was uh, about half done. But I hadn't really figured out, uh, really, I hadn't figured it out. I would collected a huge amount of evidence, but until I sat down to write the book, for, uh, actually I wrote, the, I wrote the book and rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it. But it's only when I sat down to do that final draft to send to the University of Oklahoma that I had to say, okay, here's what happened. Here's what I believe are the facts. And try to sort out the lies uh, from the believable evidence uh, to look critically as a historian at what we can believe about some of these stories and what makes sense. So often, if you're looking at a Mormon historical event, uh, it, it, if, you, if you can step back, I, I, of course, was raised in all this. If you step back, you go, well, now wait a minute. Nobody could possibly believe that. But if you're raised in the culture, it's like, how could anybody not believe it? And what's what surprised me was how many elements of this uh, atrocious, shocking cover story, which is self-contradictory and contains any number of challenges to common sense, how ingrained I was in that viewpoint. And I very much started out from where Winita Brooks started out. And I was, I'd seen the Dimmick Huntington Journal, which I think is unambiguous evidence uh, that Brigham Young was guilty of at least 10 counts of felony murder. I think that is open and shut. I don't think there was a jury in the West uh, that wouldn't uh, 
convict Brigham Young on the evidence coming out of a document that's been in church archives since May 1859. But I didn't think I could find the, the smoking gun, the, the piece of evidence that really convinced me why did they do it? What was the motivation? And do remind me, because I, tend, I wander around in these talks, but let me tell you at the end how I found the piece of evidence by serendipitously. It was someplace I never, th I thought I'd never, I never even thought to look at this thing, because I thought it can't, it's such a dishonest source, it can't possibly have anything of relevance. Um, but I'll, I'll get back to that. But it was only writing that last draft that I had to sit down and say, okay, did something happen in Cedar City? Was there a provocation for this massacre? Um, and I sent her a copy of the, a chapter that I'd written called, or a section called Explosion in Cedar City to David Begler, a dear friend and a great historian of the West. stories told about the purported land pirates from Missouri, which is how the Fancher Party has been painted. Uh, not one of them was consistent. Not one of them painted an event that looked like another event. It's always somebody else's mother who gets ridden off the street, or somebody else's chicken that gets its head popped off with a bullwhip. And sometimes it, the chicken's head is popped off by a female teamster. So I, I just, it was like, up, an enlightenment to say, wait a minute, none of this makes sense. And none of it morally makes sense. Uh, and I also felt that if I was going to, if I was going to conclude that Brigham Young did this and make an argument that he did, uh, then I also better have pretty damn good evidence. But that's one thing I didn't set out to do. I did not set out to prove that Brigham Young ordered the Mountain Hills Massacre. First of all, I didn't think it was even possible. And I still don't think, <laughs> I'm sure, that if I had a signed confession from Brigham Young, uh, validated as being in his handwriting by Dean Jesse and every other Mormon expert on handwriting, uh, witnessed by all 12 of the apostles, uh, nobody believed it. It wouldn't make any difference. So I, I recognized that it was foolish to try to, to uh, build a polemic, to try to prove something. So what I realized was no one's ever told this story very well. This is an incredible story. It is an awful tale, but it is an American tragedy. It's, a, first of all, an American crime, but it is this incredible, epic story. And I thought, look, if I can tell this story accurately and fairly, tell what happened when, and I believe chronology is a key to understanding history. I'm of the school of history of that one damn thing happens after another and that chance plays an enormous role in human history. Uh, and that if you want to track an event, look at the sequence of events. And in many ways, chronology is the key to figuring out the basic parameters of Mount Meadows. Here's an example. The Fancher Party doesn't get to Cedar City until Friday evening, September 4th. On Monday morning, September 7th, they are attacked by a large force of Mormons and Indians. And these Indians are allegedly assembled all the way from the Muddy River, which is 80, 90 miles away from Mount Meadows, all the way up to Cedar City, which is a span of 120 miles. Guess what? You can't get pissed off on Friday night and organize an orchestrated military attack on a wagon train over the weekend. You simply can't get your, your people there to do it. So what does that tell you? It means that whoever ordered this event did it before the Thatcher Party got to southern Utah. If it was ordered before they got there, 
Whatever they did in southern Utah was irrelevant. It didn't matter. Their fate had already been determined elsewhere. So I think there are any number of ways to uh, use this, uh, these techniques effectively. And I also felt that if I didn't write a polemic, if I didn't set up to prove a case, um, that that would let readers make their own judgments. And I find it ironic that uh, the critics who say that I'm biased and that I don't like Brigham Young, uh, well, they're probably right. Personally, I don't like Brigham Young. As a professional historian, I believe I gotta give the guy his due and I've gotta be as fair with him as I would be with any other historical figure. And I think that shows through in the work too. But what I think validates that I was able to write a pretty unbiased work is the simple fact that these same critics say, well, you know what, there's no smoking gun there. He doesn't prove that Brigham Young did anything wrong. And that I, I'm intrigued that people look at this book in many ways like a Rorschach test. They see in it what they want to see in it. And it, it also intrigues me because I don't think the, the evidence is ambiguous. Uh, when Brigham Young gives the cattle belonging to these immigrants to the Southern Paiutes, and seven days later, they're among the people who attack these people. And in that first attack, they kill 10 people. Is there, are there any attorneys here? What is that? What kind of a crime is that? It's a premeditated crime. It's bribery, also. It's a agent of perjury, something like that. It's felony murder. It's felony murder. It's, it's a simple, straight up case. Uh, but you know what? I don't stop everything and go, see this? See, this is what happened. This is the, this is the key. I tell it as part of this story. And I believe that readers who are reading it intelligently will say, yep, that's it. Uh, also, there's this growing accumulation of circumstantial evidence, which is, I think, overwhelming. And not only that, we have Brigham Young telling us why he did it. I didn't make this up. And it was when I began to look and believe what Brigham Young was saying, that I finally began to understand what happened. And I, you guys are getting tired of hearing people talk at you, so I'm going to cut to some of the, read some of my favorite quotes. Um, Mormon historians love to argue that there were no uh, blood atonements in Utah, and that violence, you know, really was very low level, and was, what there was is frontier violence. But as Wallace Stegner said, to pretend that there were no holy murders in Utah and along the trails to California, that there was no saving of the souls of sinners by the shedding of their blood during the blood atonement revival of, the, of 1856, that there were no mysterious disappearances of apostates and offensive Gentiles is simply bad history. And uh, I want to do a quote from Brigham Young. Oh, there are a couple of great uh, other quotes. But I want to also point to the specific language and some of the quotes. Um, in, in, this, in many ways, this isn't the most telling material. This is out of the journal of discourse. You go look it up yourself. Uh, the most telling stuff comes out of the unpublished sermons, which I was astonished to be able to see. And I think that provides the political explanation for what Brigham Young was doing. But as he was preaching blood atonement early in 1857, uh, Brigham Young asked, will you love that man or woman well enough to shed their blood? He knew hundreds of people who could have been saved if their lives had been taken and their blood spilled on the ground as a smoking incense to the Almighty, but who are now angels of the devil. If a man wanted salvation and it was, quote, necessary to spill his blood on the earth in order that he might be saved, spill it. That is the way to love mankind. In private, he was even more explicit. <laughs> he told the Council of Fifty in March 1849, I want their cursed heads cut off that they may atone for their sins. Now, 
This, of course, was part of the religious doctrine that the saints had a right to kill a sinner to save him when he commits those crimes that can only be atoned for by the shedding of blood, as Jedediah Grant of the First Presidency insisted. Grant advised sinners to ask Brigham Young to appoint a committee to attend to their case and then let a place be selected and let that committee shed their blood. We have those amongst us that are full of all manner of abominations, those who need to have their blood shed, for water will not do, and their sins are of too deep a dye. Now, we can always listen to Elder Bruce R. McConkie, who said blood atonement was a rhetorical advice that has never been practiced by the church at any time. And then he tells you the rules of it, how it actually works. <laughs> and then it will be working when we get to the millennium and um, that wonderful theocracy that is in all of our futures. <laughs> but Juanita Brooks concluded blood atonement was a t literal and terrible reality. Brigham Young advocated it and preached it without compromise. Um, there have been one or two other quotes, but now I'm going to get to the, the punchline of this story. And it is the question, why did they do it? Basically, I believe they did it because they were told to do it. They were ordered to do it. I hope that those quotes that I read at the start of this discussion drive home how relentlessly the notion of obedience was driven home to these people and how this rhetoric didn't only convey these passionate religious beliefs, it conveyed a very real threat, which was you will obey or you will be killed. And there were many men at Mountain Meadows who said, I did it because I believed that I myself would be killed. I do want to point out to you, though, that that is not a defense of murder. In English common law, English common law requires that before you shed someone else's blood, you have to die yourself. And I think that given the experience of the man who did this, it's probably far and away the better choice. Why do I believe this? I believe, believe it because that's what Brigham Young said. That's why Brigham Young said it happened. I want to read the quote. This was stated uh, on, the, I believe, the 30th of May, 1861. The week before, Brigham Young had gone through Mountain Meadows, and he had come to the side of the grave where, after two years, the U.S. Army had arrived and found the bones of these people still littered on the ground, found tresses of hair uh, scattered about, found the clothing of women and children, and they gathered up the remains they could find, and they interred them in several different graves. At the site of the wagon siege, they put the bodies in the siege pits that they dug to defend themselves gave them a military burial, orienting them as they would uh, fallen soldiers, and then raised a cairn above their grave. At the top of it, they put a verse from Romans, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And Brigham Young showed up with an entourage of 120 people, riding in his carriage, rode up, looked at the monument, looked at the inscription, and said, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and I have taken a little. And he raised his arm to the square, and as Dimmick Huntington told his granddaughter, Anita Brooks, within five minutes, not one rock was standing on another. A week later, after preaching at Brig John D. Lee's family hall, President Young said that the company that was used up at Mountain Meadows were the fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, and connections of those that murdered the prophets. They merited their fate, 
And the only thing that ever troubled him was the lives of the women and children. But that under the circumstances, this could not be avoided. Sounds like Donald Rumsfeld and collateral <laughs> damage. <laughs> But uh, th that's it. I mean, there, there's the reason the Mountain Meadows Massacre happened. But as a historian, I still, didn't <clears throat> I still don't think that that answered the question, was it really ordered beforehand? Was Brigham Young's action in giving the cattle to the Paiutes, that was certainly felony murder, but did he really anticipate that it would result in the killing of 80 women and children? Um, those, I thought, were questions that I never really find a definitive answer for. And ironically, I found it uh, when a, one of my, uh, I'm a, an independent historian, I, I uh, hire out my services, and one of my clients said, I want you to go look at the diary of Elias Smith for 1857. And I said to Bill, you know, Bill, I've looked at his published diary for the 60s, he's going to tell you absolutely nothing. Uh, Elias Smith's journals, uh, if, the, if Pearl Harbor happened, he'd tell you what he had for breakfast. Um, but Bill said, he, Bill looked at every 1857 journal, I said, go down and copy them off. So I copied them off, and I went home and sat down and read them. And when I got to the 23rd of July, I knew what happened. And it was, and this is another quote that doesn't appear in the book, and it's interesting because uh, I like to think that I did it, I left it out because I didn't think that Ann Gorge Lee was a very credible witness. Ann Gorge Lee was the last 13-year-old that Brigham Young ever, no, she was the last 13-year-old that John D. Lee ever married. And she wrote this amazing autobiography. She has a, an, an, an amazing account of the Mountain Meadows Massacre. But she explains what the reason was, what people in Southern Utah believe was the reason for the massacre. And she said, Parley P. Pratt was one of the apostles and was in Kansas at Fort Scott and Fort Smith for the purposes of enlightening the people on Mormonism. He, unfortunately for himself, was murdered by the heathen Gentiles. This immigrant train happened to be from the same section of the country where he, Pratt, was killed. The Mormons were so insulted and indignant over the death or murder of Pratt that they raked untold vengeance on the poor immigrants. This is supposed to be the cause of the Mountain Meadow Massacre. I think Ann Gorge Lee is telling us exactly what people in southern Utah knew. Uh, and I had been, I had run into a mystery. Uh, Argus, uh, Charles Wandell, an apostate Mormon writer, charged that when the Fancher Party came through Salt Lake in early August 1857, Harley P. Pratt's widow, Eleanor Pratt, fingered them. She had seen, uh, she had been present, uh, she hadn't seen Pratt killed, but she'd been in Arkansas, and she'd been present, and she'd gone out and seen Pratt's body after he was murdered. She was Pratt's 12th wife. She was also the legal wife of Hector McLean. Hector McLean killed Harley P. Pratt after he was freed from a federal uh, jail and was Pratt pretty brutally murdered him on the border of Arkansas. He wrote this incredible letter um, to the Alta California uh, newspaper saying that he considered the murder of Parley P. Pratt the best act of his life. <laughs> and he said, and the people of Arkansas uh, believe, believe the same thing. But I've got to find you this quote. It's just, it's just amazing. Because it's, it's, a, it's as good an example of prophecy as you will ever find in Mormon history. <laughs> because most of our prophecies, you know, they sort of work, but you know, you got to leave off the end part or the starting part <laughs> to sort of get to the, the, the exciting part. Okay, we've got, we're getting close. Alta California, 9 July 1857. So Pratt was murdered in early May. Word's just gotten uh, to Alta, California, a letter from the murderer. The word has reached Utah on the 23rd of June. And the Alta, California says, 
whether the hot blood which must now be seething and boiling in the veins of Brigham Young and his satellites at Salt Lake is to be cooled by the murder of Gentiles who pass through their territory, whether the destroying angels of Mormondom are to be brought into requisition to make reprisals upon travelers, or whether, as has been done before, saints disguised as Indians are to constitute themselves the supposed ministers of God's vengeance. In this case, we are not informed. But have no doubt that such intentions as these are prevalent among those saintly villains, adulterers, and seducers of Salt Lake. I mean, that's as, that's as chilling a prediction of future events as I think you'll come across in Western history. Um, but I, but as, as I was investigating this, I thought there was a mystery here. Wait a minute. I knew from Eleanor Pratt's own hysterical account of the murder and her continual pleas for vengeance that she hadn't made it to St. Louis until the 18th of June. Now, the Fancher Party is through Salt Lake in early August. That's six weeks. I'm an Overland Trails historian. I'm working on a book about the Oregon California Trails. I knew that she wasn't going to get from St. Louis to Salt Lake by ox train in six weeks. She was only going to get there if she'd been expressed. And I'd never heard of any express taking Eleanor across the plains. And I thought, it's just not possible that she could be there. So I'm going through Wilford Woodard's journal. First of August, he says, I took Eleanor Pratt's statement on the murder of Parley P. Pratt. She was in Salt Lake. So that extended uh, Argus's credibility that much farther. But I still had the mystery. How did Eleanor get from St. Louis to Salt Lake that quickly? I knew it had to be by express. It had to be by some sort of special operation. The apostles who were in St. Louis that she went to don't show up until a week later on the 7th of August. So how did she get across the planets? And if I was any kind of deductive historian, I, I should have looked at the, known the obvious because there's a very famous express across the planets. But it just didn't, I, I knew that express very well and it just didn't seem possible to me that this could have had anything to do with it. But there it is, on the 23rd of July, 1857, on the eve of the 10th anniversary of Brigham Young's arrival in the Salt Lake Valley, Elias Smith, who's probate judge, cousin of Joseph Smith, and postmaster of Salt Lake, is sitting in town while every, all the other potentates have gone up into Big Cottonwood Canyon, they're camped around Silver Lake, and they will witness one of the most stirring events in the morning uh, on that 10th anniversary. At noon, Oren Porter Rockwell, Judson Stoddard, and A.O. Smoot will come thundering into camp, and they will deliver a message to the First Presidency. And that evening, Brigham Young, you can still see this rock, it's an amazing rock, will climb to the top of this rock and address the Mormon people, declare independence, and announce the army is on the way and that now the thread is broken, the kingdom of God is established, and the arrival of the army in Utah will mark the beginning of the end of days. All this is exceptionally well known. What is not, uh, is not well known is what Elias Smith revealed in his journal. Because on the evening of the 23rd, when Born Porter Rockwell came thundering down Immigration Canyon in that buckboard, sitting beside him was Eleanor Pratt. Now, that may not mean much to you, and I don't make a big deal out of it in this book, but my dear friend Harold Schindler spent 40 years investigating every known fact about Porter Rockwell. And my, my opinion was, if, if Schindler didn't know about it, it didn't happen. Um, my opinion's been re re revised since I began to see letters from R. Rockwell, which are written by other people, but a lot of evidence that Schindler was simply barred from. But I knew, when I saw that, I knew that this was a calculated act of vengeance, that the orders came from Brigham Young, 
and they originated when the apostles met on the evening of the 26th of July, 1857 at Salt Lake, and Brigham Young, recording their discussion, wrote, we discussed our enemies and underlined enemies three times. It was at that meeting that they decided to send George A. Smith south with orders to murder everyone in that party from Arkansas. And why did I know that? Because if you could expunge a fact like this from history, you didn't do it because it was just a trivial event. You did it because it told the tale. And I think you'll, you'll probably be surprised if you go back and read the book that it just is again another one of these uh, events. But it was for me a personal epiphany. And I think it gave the book some of the backbone that it's got in saying, um, here's what happened. And why I think I can speak as something of an authority. And that why I do feel that if people can't see the prima facie evidence of murder in this book, that I had to have done a good job of not of controlling my own personal biases. Because if otherwise, it would be apparent. Uh, if they, if I could have very clearly said, look, see this, this is murder. See, when Eleanor arrives, that's the smoking gun. I didn't use the word smoking gun. I just told the story. And I believe that probably most of you in this room will have no doubt about what happened. And I hope that it will also act to heal wounds and to get, bring acceptance and to vindicate the role of the Pirate Indians in this affair and to do justice to these murdered dead. Now, having said all that, I, I do want to say, um, remind you again that I am a, a Latter-day Saint and <laughs> they have not taken any action against me and I don't think they'd be stupid enough to do it. And if they do want to take action against me, I will fight back and it will not be pleasant and it will be very expensive for them. Uh, so it's like dealing with any bully. What is the way to deal with a bully? Cower before them? They'll just keep pounding on you. Stand up to them, they'll be on their knees. <laughs> but that said, I, I believe that one of the functions of this outfit that's very positive is to take uh, apostasy and uh, rejection and all the powerful emotions that are uh, uh, evoked in leaving Mormonism and healing that and making it, taking that bitterness away. And remember that although Boyd K. Packer says the truth is dangerous, the truth is mighty, and it will set you free. Thank you very much. Stand up. You guys have been sitting forever, I'm sure. Stand up, seventh inning stretch. <laughs> um, you, you had a question over there? Yeah, Will, uh, you said something early on about uh, the Mount Death Massacre did not reflect on Mormonism as a whole, something along those lines. Of course, that was just a small part, but when I bought your book, I had hoped that you would go start off with more into the entire history of the blood atonement and violence culture mm -hmm. beginning in 1838. Mm -hmm. uh, just from my amateurish study, mm -hmm. I believe that uh, Mormonism was like the mafia. Okay? Mm -hmm. that, that beginning with Joseph Smith, beginning with uh, the uh, Salt Sermon in 1838, the instigation of the Danites and all that. The supporting illegal activities, counterfeiting, there's a long list of things. Mysterious crimes. murders and disappearances in Nauvoo that John D. Lee, William Law people talked about. I believe that the Mountain Meadows Massacre was not an anomaly. It was basically Mormon but, policy that began in 1838. And I was I was going to beg you to if you don't write another book, write up a book on the whole blood atonement culture. Well, it's, it's, I, I actually wrote, one of the criticisms David Bigler uh, made about the finished book was that it didn't address the Reformation strongly enough. And in fact, I'd written a hundred, uh, uh, the, the introductory section on Mormonism initially was twice as long. 
the book's 500 pages, and that's real long for a tract. <laughs> and I had to make cuts in places. I had to cut things like these statements from the Cedar City Minutes. Um, so I essentially had to abbreviate some of the functions. And when I said in the preface that it's, it's, a, it's one event in Mormon history, um, I was trying to put it into a, a broader context. And what my belief is, is that it doesn't reflect well, and I do, but I think I also state very clearly that I believe that this event was the logical culmination of these doctrines of vengeance and blood atonement and hatred of outsiders and chosen people. I try to make very clear that this was an ideological crime that came out of these beliefs. But at the same time, you know, we, we, I'm sure we all still have Mormon friends. And they are in many ways the best people on the planet. And the people of the Mormon church hated this crime. They, they, were, they couldn't believe it happened at first. And once they recognized what happened, they knew they had been betrayed. And who betrayed them? Their leaders. And I, I, I've been criticized by some of my best Mormon friends for saying, well, you just never give the Mormon people a break. Look at the heroes in this book who are Mormons. George A. Hicks, Juanita Brooks. Um, Lincoln Smith. Clayman Smith. Uh, well, Clayman Smith is, is dicey. But Laban Morrell, Laban Morrell, who says, they all vote. I think Isaac Hayes is essentially uh, wanting to get confirmation. They've already given the orders. He wants to get the people to sign up for mass murder. So he holds this state high council meeting. He says, I want to vote that we go out and kill all these people. And they make it unanimous. You know, so let's go kill them all. And a guy shows up late, Labor Morrell. He hasn't heard the first part of the meeting. He says, uh... Why are we going to do this? Wait a minute. He says, he says shouldn't we ask Brigham Young about this first? Um, so they go, well, maybe we should. <laughs> and that leads, of course, to the cover story. Uh, and, and it's interesting because if Brigham Young is committing this crime, he's building his alibi. It, it's, not, you know, it's not a surprise, if you know how criminals operate, to see that as he's... Uh, directing this horrific massacre, he's also covering his fanning.